Thank you, Chairman Jordan, for your leadership. The FBI has been victimized by political capture, and that politicization has manifested in the targeting of Americans who never deserve to have this government weaponized against them. Whistleblowers saw those bad acts. They stepped forward, and they were retaliated against and crushed as a consequence. And our work today will build on the work of Special Counsel Durham, who said recently that at the FBI there is confirmation bias and overwillingness to rely on information from individuals connected to political opponents and action without appropriate objectivity. Uh, there, uh, one of the whistleblowers we'll hear from today served in the United States Marine Corps, served as a local cop, Garrett O'Boyle, and uh, this is uh, his testimony regarding that political capture. Do you believe that the FBI has become political? I do. I think most people out in the field um, try to avoid that politicization of, of the agency, which, I, which is good, but it's gotten to a point, it seems to me, that uh, it's, 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 it's like a cancerous point where the FBI has let itself become enveloped in this politicization and weaponization that I don't know how uh, to, to even begin to fix it. One group that saw that weaponization work against them were Catholics. The FBI field office in Richmond put out a memo saying that violent extremists would find the Catholic ideology attractive and would attempt to connect with Catholic adherents, that extremists uh, would show an interest in Catholic congregations over the next 12 to 24 months leading up to the presidential election. Isn't that an interesting coincidence? And the memo calls for the FBI to develop sources within Catholic congregations uh, to try to obtain information about those folks. Another group that saw weaponization turn against them, parents who attended school board meetings. Uh, you'll hear today from Steve Friend, who worked for the FBI and actually found himself ridiculed at his own FBI office because he, too, was a parent who attended a school board meeting. This is Steve Friend. Given your law enforcement background, does knowing that you could be investigated by the FBI for speaking up at your child's school board meeting chill parents from exercising their First Amendment rights? Yes. And you said you had attended a school board meeting and you were nervous that you could be under federal investigation. Is that correct? Yes, my colleagues teased me about it. Americans who were in Washington, D.C. on January 6th who committed no crimes, who simply attended a rally, also saw the FBI weaponized against them. George Hill was an FBI uh, employee working out of the Boston field office, and he talks about the pressure that the Washington field office was putting on Boston, and when they tried to get predicate evidence, they couldn't get it for a very interesting reason. This is George Hill. SSA for CT2 said, happy to do it, show us where they were inside the Capitol, and we'll look into it. To which WFO said, we can't show you those videos unless you can tell us the exact time and place those individuals were inside the Capitol. To which the SSA responded back, and I was privy to these conversations firsthand, why can't you show us, why can't you just send us, give us access to the 11,000 hours of videos that you did that you failed? Because there may be, may be, UCs, undercover officers, or CHSs, confidential human, confidential human sources, on those videos whose identity we need to protect. Marcus Allen, an FBI analyst who did work around evidence, sharing it with folks, he saw videos that concerned him about the federal government's own involvement in January 6th. Here's Marcus Allen.
so much of the good work happening at the FBI is throughout this country, and a lot of the rot the committee has learned emerges out of headquarters and out of the Washington field office. Gerardo Boyle described the conflict that existed as the Washington field office put pressure on other field offices around the country to engage in law enforcement work without predication. This is Mr. O'Boyle. One example that I have personally, I, I made this, this is one of my protected disclosures, so I'll just touch on it a little bit, but um, I received a lead about someone based on an anonymous tip, and in law enforcement, anonymous tips don't hold very much weight, especially without evidence that you can corroborate uh, pretty easily. I wasn't able to quote, corroborate anything they said, um, even after speaking with the person they allege potential criminal behavior of. While I'm trying to figure all that out, I get another lead from the same agent who sent me that lead. And um, they, they essentially tried to get me to violate policy or law. Trying to get people to break the law without sufficient predication is a weaponization of our government, and all Americans suffer when resources are misallocated, when stats are padded following 9-11, the FBI set up all of these terrorism entities to look outward at people abroad who might seek to harm our country. But a lot of those authorities were turned inward against our own people, and the result was stat padding for the purpose of FBI officials trying to convince Congress that the violent extremism threat was more enhanced than it indeed was. And we got critical testimony on that point also from Mr. O'Boyle. As a DT agent, I encountered similar um, stat padding or case bolstering. Truth be told, that was one case. Like, but the FBI had me open up four different cases um, because they had me open a case for every individual that I had a um, articulable factual basis that there may have been um, potential federal law being violated. Or like on a criminal case. Say you're working in the gang, which is, this case was, I guess, like a militia. Um, if you're working with the gang, you have a case open on the gang, and you have a subfile for each person in it. Like, the, you, know, you know, John Doe 1, 2, and 3, they all have their own subfile. Or in my case, John Doe 1, 2, 3, and 4 all have their own separate case, because then the FBI can, from my perspective, <coughs> the FBI can come back to Congress and say, look at all the domestic terrorism we've investigated. But really, I was working one case that the FBI can then say, well, he actually had four. So you, you know, maybe you should give us more money because look at how big of a threat all this domestic terrorism is. Padding the stats to try to showcase a problem that is overemphasized political capture and political infection of our law enforcement. These brave patriots spoke up about it. They'll be testifying to our committee today. And my colleagues will now discuss some of the intense and depraved retaliation that they had to experience. And I'd recognize my colleague from Florida, Kat Kamek, to share some of those thoughts with us. Well, good morning. I, I really can't say uh, that this today, what you are hearing, what you will be hearing more of in this hearing uh, in the coming hours, um, uh, could, it couldn't be overstated how important this is. I think, uh, Representative Gates, you just laid out uh, very succinctly why this is so critical. You know, I know a lot of people back home are wondering, you know, we hear about this weaponization, you guys get up here, you investigate, but nothing ever seems to happen. Think about this for a minute, though. Why this is so critical that we are investigating the weaponization of the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Department of Justice. As was pointed out, if you are a parent and you attend a school board meeting, there could be an FBI agent in the parking lot scribbling down your license plate number. This is not a conspiracy theory. This is actually testimony that these brave whistleblowers have given us. That is not America that I know. If you are a Catholic and you want to attend Catholic Mass, perhaps there is an informant inside 
reporting on what you are doing inside. This is, this is, this is the thing that novels are, are written about. This is spy movies. If you think about the FBI whistleblowers who have come forward bravely, this today will demonstrate the pattern that the FBI has used in retaliating against them and their families because their families have served just as honorably alongside them. These men have served our country, both in law enforcement and in the United States military. Furthermore, as we have seen, these are decorated individuals who were led down a path only to find themselves left out in the cold, iced out, and this was by design. When the FBI was questioned about this, the word that kept coming back was, it's a coincidence. It's a coincidence that they leave these people in a position where they cannot seek outside employment, they cannot access their personal belongings, despite the fact that these men have served their country, but even worse, the loyalty to the nation has been questioned. This is truly the weaponization of government. Whether you are the President of the United States, as we have seen in the Durham report, whether or not you are a parent, concerned about your child's education, whether you are just someone who wants to go to mass. You could find yourself a target of the FBI. This FBI certainly knows no bounds, and we are seeing that in every single interview, in every single piece of evidence that we uncover. And this is really just the tip of the iceberg, but I would like to reiterate what, my rep what Representative Matt Gates said earlier. This is not about the good men and women of the FBI, the rank and file agents who do their job honorably. No, this is about the political corruption at the very top that has seeped down into every field office across this nation. If you don't tow the company line, you might, you might find yourself a target of the FBI, whether you are an outsider or an insider. And that is what we seek to uncover. One of my colleagues here today will outline some of the key retaliation points, so I don't want to belabor that point. But I do want to say to those that are concerned that we investigate and there is no subsequent action, everyone standing behind me agrees. We have to present the evidence, we have to deliver that evidence, and then we have to take action to make sure that there are consequences, but also that this never happens again. That is why in this particular case, I am so glad that the treatment of these whistleblowers is being referred to by the U.S. Office of Special Counsel and the Inspector General for further investigation. And I would encourage you all today in today's hearing to witness the treatment that these whistleblowers will receive from our colleagues on the other side of the aisle who will seek to discredit them at every turn. I would like you to keep in mind the contrast during the January 6th testimony of how their whistleblowers were treated. With that, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, 